Hello, my name is Hiroja Shive, and this is Toshi's Treasure Hunters. And this is a show that covers the crypto puzzle game Satoshi's Treasure Hunt, in which the grand prize, if you will, will be $1 million USD equivalent in Bitcoin. On this particular episode, we're going to talk about clans, um, how you can join them, if you will, about clan or group dynamics, management, if you will, my thoughts about a potential, uh, if I were, I don't know, head honcho of a clan, if you will, or my proposal, I would be so vocal in, you know, prize allocations and just, you know, what to really expect, really, and, and how to better participate in the treasure hunt for the uh, $1 million in uh, USD in Bitcoin, in which the objective is to achieve uh, unlocking of 400 keys to order to obtain the bounty. So let's kind of get into it. So, <clears throat> one of the things that has been kind of been brought up like socially if you were speaking besides just privacy data breaches and monetization on the internet is um, groups how to participate in a group how to participate in forums and group dynamics moderation uh, which goes into uh, depending on you know, where you are globally about free speech, content creation, ownership, things of that nature. And group dynamics is, you know, management of group dynamics and participation in, in a large group. That difficulty is not exclusive to the Internet. It is all over in the world from workplace to school to your own family dynamics to friend sets to uh, structures of businesses, nonprofits, everywhere you go. How the how to manage a large group of people is a dilemma. There's there all different styles. There's hierarchical management. There's non-hierarchical management. There's really um, draconian measurements. You know measures to manage a group of people. There's loose affiliations. There's all sorts of ways to try to govern a large group of people. And your definition of a large group of people might be different for somebody else, particularly if they are maybe accustomed to being with a large group. So a large group to them might be something that's like, you know, 100 people, where to you that's like, that's tremendously large. Or it could be tremendously small because you're used to being in a much larger set of maybe 200 people a dynamic. Or a large group to you is 50 people and 100 is something unmanageable. Or 10 people, 5 people, it's, you know, for each individual it can be very different uh, based on their experiences and social experiences. And with the internet, because of the ease of usage of communications, uh, the different types of contact development and different group dynamics that already exist in the world, they kind of bring that onto the internet. And people are accustomed to different levels of grouping, if you will, when it comes to the interactions on the internet. And, you know, some people are used to be part, part of teams because, you know, they played Call of Duty, they played, you know, World of Warcraft, uh, they've done treasure hunts before, they have done crypto puzzles in groups before, so they're accustomed to participating in a group dynamic instead of huddling off into, not like a dark corner or anything, but huddling off in a corner and, and doing it themselves, you know, on an individual basis. Then they might not, they may have done single, you know, single player games or uh, first person shooters, if you will, but um, that's not their sole jam. That's not just something they they just do s exclusively, and that can bring um, you know certain types of issues, particularly for people that are not accustomed to participating. Uh, this might be the first time they've really done a group type of dynamic on the internet. Uh, maybe they watch stuff on streaming, or maybe they're accustomed to being like in a small set, like a Call of Duty or uh, World of Craft or uh, Apex Legends, where there's like maybe four or five you're accustomed to, and maybe you have a loose affiliation of a group of 20 people you play on the, you know, Xbox or PS2, not PS2, but uh, the PlayStation systems and playing games. But here, you, you're having a much larger global dynamic where there might be communication issues because you could not speak the same language. Uh, there's a different level of skill sets where people have a great strong 
uh, understanding of cartography. Uh, they can code break, but maybe they don't. They're not very good with uh, logical clues. Which I know that sounds very weird when it comes to code breaking, but you know uh, the distances key is an example where you have to do like a little bit of internet sleuthing and kind of navigating and asking the right questions and going different down, down different internet rabbit holes, if you will. Maybe some people are not skilled in that area, uh, and so. There's a, you know, when it comes to that, some people might think their power set, if you will, if we're going to keep on with the gaming analogy, might be much higher than maybe it actually really is. Uh, they might think their power set is very low, when in fact they might have something significant to contribute to a clan, and it really just takes them vocalizing and working within the group to realize what their power set is, really, truly is, uh, what their contribution can be to the clan. Because you cannot, as the, the game makers have put it in the different uh, clues they've dropped, uh, in their media drops, in the um, informational from just directly from the game, even if you've never read any or, or watched any YouTube things from them or any uh, listened to any podcasts or read any news articles about the game, uh, they have stated that this is something that they've put, like an individual hunter can, but preferably a clan should you know you should work with a clan to do this you should work within a group to order to achieve because really the game is not designed even if someone were to do it to be played by an individual it's meant to be a group participation um, that's one of the key dynamics now there's no set limit to what that group could be it could be very, like I said it could be very massive uh, 200 300 500 people in a group or something small set like a 50 or 20 people in a group it really fundamentally comes down to how you wish to shape your clan what it is you're looking to achieve beyond just receiving the bounty because everyone you know you know is kind of trying to win the grand prize here but if you don't have enough you know maybe code breakers or people globally distributed throughout uh, the globe to get those geolocation keys or having someone that has the ability to um, task or all the different skill sets if you're missing something from your group it can be very difficult for you to achieve all the different types of keys that are have uh, been developed uh, for this game all the and figure out all the different clues so when it comes to making a clan you know it does come down to you know trust um, it comes down to you know achievable goals, you know, what kind of people you're looking for, um, what the end result is, do you publicly publish, you know, the public keys like some groups have done, um, do you share that knowledge, or do you keep it hidden and, and don't publish, uh, do you not even publish within your own clan, if, like the person didn't participate in that key, they don't get that key, or, um, you know, I share it all with the group no matter what the participation is. Um, how the prize is going to be distributed. Uh, all these different things could, you know, help with the understanding of the group dynamic, but, you know, your end goal for your clan, and, um, you know, the, it, there is a bit of a monetary value uh, attached to this. So people, when it comes to money, they get hurt, really hurt feelings really, really quick. Even if you enjoy and get the pure enjoyment of solving these clues and solving for these puzzles, and that that's fine with you as on an individual basis, and it would be great if you win the prize. But just achieving that, you know, that uh, intellectual itch, if you will, or that you know achievable goal of I have accomplished something like this, or if you're like myself and you're you're trying to learn on the go, being able to go back and figure out certain keys on yourself, or having learned the lessons from previous clues to be able to apply it to the next clue and being able to solve for that uh, might help build your skill set for something other later on in life or something like that and that might be something that's worthwhile for you as an individual but there is still money on the line and so um, like I said how you develop your clan or your group those type of group dynamics and I have some links in the show notes about group dynamics and stuff like that um, is important as a clan to maybe either you set those rules out from the very beginning and I'll talk about the, a couple of the different public can, clans and how they're doing it or you know you achieve a certain group level and they're like okay 
we talk amongst ourselves, what are the rules? How are we doing this? What are we looking for? Or you can just be kind of like a, a loose affiliation of people that just come together when is necessary and part for, from different puzzles and stuff, and that, and that might work. Or you might base it on, you know, the space that we're kind of in, which is in the cryptocurrency space, um, Bitcoin consensus. So let's talk about some of the public clans that do exist already and a couple group dynamic things to think of when either participating in a clan or trying to form your own clan yourself. So here's one group that is out there, um, but they are. So here's one group that is out there um, in playing this game, but they are in fact um, a private group. They don't share information about what keys they have solved or who the, their clan level is or participants. Um, it's like an invitation only, and if they decide that you have the skill sets that they're looking for. Um, then you're part of the group. And that is one way this particular clan, which is called the DPR Avengers clan, has decided to do this. And they stated out right here in the Google Doc sheet, if you will, to participate. So if you fill up this form, you're interested in joining the Dread Pirate Roberts Avengers. It's Satoshi's Treasure team organized by Mary Bent and Matt O'Dell of Mary Bent's Tales from the Crypt and Rabbit Hole Recap and Brady Swinson of Citizen Bitcoin. These are the guys that have been in the space for a very long time. If you're familiar with those names, have you seen them on Twitter, um, Bitcoin Talk, or when you're looking up information via either YouTube or uh, podcasts, uh, these are podcasts, uh, podcast shows, Tales from the Crypt, uh, Rabbit Hole Recap, and Citizen Bitcoin. They've been around for years now within the space. So they have some, I guess you could say, um, <sighs> Credibility, um, I want to, I forget what that term about leadership, whatever. But they've been, they've been in, in the space. So some people can say, okay, you can check their history of what their opinions are and what they've done in the past. And you can see if this is somebody you want to rock with, if you will. Uh, the DPR Avengers will donate 10% of any prize our team wins while playing Satoshi's Treasure to Free Ross Ulbrich. Uh, we're looking to build a geographic, diverse team of people with various knowledge and skills, including puzzles, alternative reality games, cryptography, coding, research, the internet, Bitcoin history, science, and humanities. There will be a limited number of teams to keep things manageable. Please don't take it personally if you don't get invited. A lot of teams will form and probably merge over the course of the game in the quest to achieve 400 unique keys and then you fill it out so right off the bat they've stated basically a, a purpose you know this is kind of invitational only one uh, what skill sets they're looking for two three how they're going to do um, some of the prize allocation like 10 percent of it is going to go to this uh, charitable cause cause which is freeze Ro free ross Ulbrich. So right off the bat, if this is something that up your alley, uh, if you have those skill sets, you think you qualify to perhaps participate in this group, uh, also for they're going to limit the number of people, then you would fill out this form and see if, hey, you, you make the cut, if you will. And I f imagine from in there internally, they have like whatever the rest of the prize allocation um, dispense out how they deem fit. So right off the bat, it kind of makes some clarity about what it is you can expect from, at least initially from this initial offer, what you expect from participating in this clan or trying to participate in this clan. So you might say they have a very structured or a nice set of hierarchical, I want to say hierarchical, but a nice set of rules, if you will, um, to participate. And then you have the Steam Clan. Um, the Steam Clan comes from Steam It. Uh, they've been participating in part of the Satoshi Treasure Hunters for from the very beginning, if you will. Now, if you go uh, to this post in here, it says 94 followers, 45 following. So you can say they might have 100 people within their group, but, you know, that's just, that's not, I would say, a very strong hard set. Uh, about their clan 
and they're also coming from Steam it itself. So you have to already kind of be part of the community to already kind of become part of this community, if you will. And <coughs> they kind of have a blog post here about what it is they're looking for. So, so every steaman is a treasure hunter. So this is what they did. We need everyone to join a steam clan to help us bring one million dollars back to the steam blockchain. This is by Dr. Crypto. I know I felt the same way when I first started. What could I contribute? I don't really know anything about treasures. It turns out I actually can contribute. Even though I'm not a computer program or cryptologist, I have found a place here solving puzzles and working on weekly clues. We are a Steam team searching for Toshi's treasure. If you're Steaming, then you're part of the team as well. The contest is simple. 1,000 clues will be given, and the first team to give 400 wins, 400 wins 1 million in Bitcoin. Thanks to Steam Engine, participants will earn SST tokens depending on their help and different clues. When we win, the money we put into those tokens. I am calling on all my friends to join the Steam Clan Discord server, stop in and say hi. There are a few clues that we haven't gotten yet, and new clues are being released almost daily. We are uh, clue 20, and there are 1,000. The good news is that Steam Clan is killing it. I'm not sure how many clues we have now, but we are in the top three teams. It might seem a bit overwhelming at first, but there are a lot of helpful people on Discord to guide you. So they're inviting people that are already participants of one much larger but niche community. Mind you, Bitcoin in itself is still kind of niche, if you will. Even cryptography and computer skills and treasure hunting is already niche in itself. So there's niches within niches within niches. And they're inviting other people from their community to join this much smaller subset community. Uh, go on to Discord and participate. And they're pretty much acknowledging that not everyone might have the, the key necessary um, <clears throat> skill sets, but you never know because of the different varied uh, degrees or varying flavors of clues that we drop that you don't necessarily, necessarily need to be a programmer or a cryptologist to participate in this particular game, if you will. Um, also, you know, they're stating that if you are a participant in this clan, you're going to get this token, which is going to be backed by the Bitcoin prize. So you're going to have a token that could potentially be worthless if you participate, uh, if your team doesn't win. So that could be a downer for some people or an increasing incentive where they can have the value of both the Bitcoin and the value of the token, but I'm not sure that's going to really translate too heavily. You know, beyond this group, who else is going to have uh, that token? You know, how how is that really going to dispense uh, the pairing, if you will? Will exchanges accept that token? Will businesses or other people accept that token, even though it's backed by this Bitcoin? And back in it, is it back like go to the dollar, the whole concept of that? back in the day so it's a little weird if you will and some people are put off by tokens either from the very beginning or just fatigue from the ICO crash and all the different alls and stuff like that there there might be a little bit of fatigue when it comes to tokens so there's that particular dynamic with this particular clan so I do think that the steam clan even though the token thing might be a little iffy for people does have advantage over some of the other clans out there because they're already pulling from a very existing large community to form their smaller community and I think when that Bitcoin address the the public address with the exact amount of Bitcoin is made available I think they will have the greater advantage because then people's eyes and ears are going to perk up and they're going to go, oh, okay, this is actually real. It's not a scam. There is actually a prize, which is something that's been kind of plaguing the Satoshi treasure hunt for a while now, that the the Bitcoin address has not been publicly disclosed, if you will. Even though the, the game makers have said that it's going to be a clue uh, to solve for, to be able to find, I think, um, you know, Compared to other, and I've talked about this before, compared to other crypto puzzle prizes in the past, that's always been disclosed right up front, right off the bat. 
the public address and verification ownership of that particular address. Now, <clears throat> I do think because they're, like I said, they're pulling from a larger pool of people, I think they'll get more people coming into their clan from this community because of that. And if you look, if you look, uh, they have um, posts that are in different languages. I've consistently seen that from them. Uh, so they, they're truly global. They're translating stuff for so other members of the community can participate. They're just not simply, you know, English-based or Western-based um, member base of the global community. It's, it's a little bit more varied. Uh, I think that's really going to be helpful for them in the long term in finding um, enough people to solve for these keys. And so there's that particular dynamic there. If you, you know, you probably have, you have to, like, join Steam it to join this clan, to uh, be rewarded in these tokens and extra points um, to order to achieve the prize, I think that is, um, you know, again, something you might want to look for or towards when looking at the clan, that type of dynamic, if you will, is that something you want to participate in because it could be, it could be overwhelming if you think about it. They're drawing from a larger community that could benefit them from winning the prize but what if their clan is like a thousand people it kind of dilutes the I guess you could say the economic value or the satoshi value of, of what a reward you could be receiving and then the other public group is <coughs> the Toshi Cypher group uh, so they have a point system a leaderboard if you will in which uh, right here on their website, they are the clan that consistently publicly discloses not all keys, but a significant portion of their keys are disclosed uh, for anyone to grab, if you will. Um, they're, you know, you have to basically what they've done is you sign up, you participate um, primarily through their, their Telegram chat, and I'll get into Telegram in a moment. Uh, the, they have their keys broken into different rooms, if you were, whatever. And the people that help solve for that particular key are rewarded points. And if the particular key is publicly disclosed, then it's publicly disclosed. If it's not, then those pe participants are the ones who have the particular key. Um, so there's that dyna dynamic of having a point system. Uh, if you go on to their site, our team, their manifesto. So about us. Before we became a clan to participate in Satoshi's treasure hunt, when a clue dropped about a key being rare and possibly unique, we all individually saw the greedy, secretive, and deceptive personalities come out. If you can't find the conscious you want to be in the world, then create it. That's the beginning of Toshi Cipher. All the above mentioned individuals that are now part of this clan were picked because they cared more about the adventure than the prize. For some it's emotional, for some it's spiritual, for some it's just about friendship and playing together. The reason we will win is because we all share these mutual philosophies. One, have fun. Two, make friends, learn, and grow. And these are our top leaders. They're publicly disclosed here. They're highly um, participants in the official Satoshi Treasure Hunt telegram as well as their own telegram. And so their emphasis is just, you know, community above all else. Um, they feel that is the, the best mechanism, if you will, of uh, the group dynamic that they need to, to win for the bounty, for the prize. And so that is something, you know, again, what is it you're looking to achieve um, as a participant in this game? Um, what kind of group dynamic are you looking for? Is it something like where you have to be chosen, like um, Dread Pirate Roberts? Is it something where there's extra incentives, like the Steam Clan? Um, or like with Toshi Cypher, where is more of an emphasis on community and friendship and building and if we win the prize yay if we don't and, and look at the journey that we've been on uh, so as an individual hunter that is something that you um, could look into for yourself now <clears throat> I just want to throw this out there just a thought about you know a size of a clan or a group uh, there's this um a theory, if you will, about called Dumber's, Dumber's Number. It's, I have this right here up on the Wicca. Uh, it's a 
cognitive limit of the number of people with whom one can maintain a social relationship with, uh, which an individual knows who each person is, how each person relates to each other person, and the number was proposed in 1990 by this anthropologist Robin Dunbar, and that number uh, is proposed to lie between 100 and 150. The commonly used value is 150. So social connections that people have in life through their family, friendships, uh, work, whatever group dynamics is up to 150 people is something that people can have these, you know, strong interpersonal relationships, a cohesiveness or stability within a group. And anything larger than that, you start seeing breakdowns within uh, individual connections within the community and the community as, as a whole is pretty much the basis of that particular theory. Um, so maybe, you know, thinking about the dynamics of not only just the core philosophy of your the type of clan you want to join or the one that you're creating, but you also have to look at, you know, beyond the skill sets of each individual hunters and what they're bringing to the clan, you might also have to think how large you want your clan to be. I have a link in the show notes to an OK article about Bitcoin consensus. Basically, what consensus fundamentally comes down to is just like the dictionary version. Everyone pretty much has to be on the same page. If you have, I won't say a single individual, but enough people to not agree upon whatever Bitcoin implementation is, then it's not going to happen. And that's why there are these forks. You have to not just have like a majority, majority, but a really like almost 99, 90% of people going along down the path. Um, otherwise, the protocol is not going to work. The protocol implementations, the upgrades or whatever is not going to happen. Now, if people choose not to follow down that path, they can, of course, pick up their ball and go. That's what's happened with some of the Bitcoin forks. That's what some people have done. Or they can, um, because much of the Bitcoin protocol has this backward compatibility, still go upon the old path, if you will. Um, but that old path is not going to affect the, the new path, and the new path is really not going to affect the old path. Um, you can just continue to use like the, the one address for Bitcoin instead of the SegWit address, which begins with a three. Um, that's your choice to do. Uh, you don't have to uh, use SegWit if you do not want to. Um, people might prefer, like when they receive their Bitcoins because of UTXOs and stuff like that, that maybe you can send that to a, a SegWit address first before sending that to them so they're not getting hit with a bunch of fees later down the road. But that's, you know, that's people's individual choices and no one can mandate that they have to switch to the three address or mandate that the three addresses, you know, because SegWit has been implemented, have to just use one addresses or whatever. Uh, the, pur the purpose of consensus is to get such an agreement upon all the players, the miners, the users, the node operators, the um, developers, everyone who has a stake in the Bitcoin uh, community uh, must, in fact, you know, put forth effort to participate, put forth effort of what implementations, where the governance is going, and, and that type of a deal in order to really have fundamentally have a say. And it really comes down to is miners and node operators. Um, miners can try to do whatever they want, but if the nodes, node operators are not going to validate the chain, then they're going to kick it back, then it's not going to happen. That's how you get orphan blocks. Um, that's how you get invalid blocks. That's how you, you know, because of node operators, that's how you stop uh, double spending. And, you know, Bitcoin mine operators can shut off their miners and the network can be become less secure and it can result in um, double spending or spamming or attacks on the Bitcoin network, that type of deal. So there's a little bit of checks and balances within the community in itself. And simply because the implementation uh, is proposed through the BIPs doesn't mean it's going to happen. I mean, it took three years to get SegWit on. Lightning Network is just kind of coming along here and couldn't come along without SegWit. 
So, and there's other implementations that are people are working on, and that people have been talking about for years now, um, that are being proposed and developed upon, but still haven't fully been implemented because one, the the proposal hasn't really been approved, it hasn't been really put forth to the community to have miners, you know, implement the new code. Um, consensus hasn't yet quite been achieved because people have not said. Yeah, I like the idea of Taproot, but let's let's see the code first. Let's see some other things first. Let's maybe we should do something else before Taproot. Those type of deals or conversations haven't really fully been done yet, and so you could go by consensus where everyone agrees to what the prize allocation is, uh, how points or how you are going to reward people for finding, you know, deciphering the clues and finding the keys. I know how many people are in the group, what level of, of effort people have to do, is it consistent or could they find like the 10 hardest keys and they're golden. Um, you know, those type of rules and have an agreement within the entire group instead of maybe the person who created the group being, you know, kind of like a div benevolent dictator setting forth the rules and either everyone's on board or they can take a hike um, maybe a select group of community you know a community of people make the rules and again uh, if you don't like the rules everyone can take a hike there are no rules um, we're just kind of not saying winging it but having faith and trust in people that this is a group dynamic and we're all working as a group to obtain all these keys and then we're all going to share in the bounty once um, a member of the group has unlocked that particular last key, if you will, or the particular um, Bitcoin address that so the allocation of funds is going to go to everybody. So there's that. So this is the official chat room for Satoshi's Treasure uh, from the game makers themselves. You can find a lot of different clans um, like the Toshi Cypher, Steam Clan, the E Clan, which I'll talk about. This new clan I haven't quite heard about, Key uh, Keychain Hunters. Um, I guess these you can say these are the public clans that have publicly put themselves out there for anyone to join. Um, there's plenty of private clans that come in here. They share. Everyone pretty much shares notes, say where they are, uh, try to recruit people to to their clans, um, talk to one another, share tools, try to do team ups. To, particularly when it comes to geolocation keys, you see a lot of activity of getting teams up and getting people out to the to the various locations that a geolocation uh, clue has taken them. Um, so it's a great resource if you're a beginner, individual hunter, maybe you don't like the particular clan you're part of, you're looking for a new clan to start up or participate in, that's the spot really to go to is Telegram. And I think Telegram will be the spot for the rest of the game, except for maybe Weibo, um, which is the Chinese um, messaging app because China. But it also has, there's a lot of, there's a huge community within um, Weibo that are participants of Satoshi Treasure um, there. And if you are, you know, I don't know, bilingual, trilingual, or you uh, understand Mandarin, I would encourage you to get onto Weibo and um, participate in that fashion as well to participate in those clans or recruit people from those clans into your own clan or join a clan there and um, participate in the hunt that way. Um, with Telegram, kind of like WhatsApp, they're more so, I think, even than Twitter, they're pretty much the top downloadable apps, more so than Discord, really. I think um, because Discord has, like, video and audio chats, even though Telegram does have audio chat, it's very heavy on that. It's um, Telegram, you can probably have the most basic smartphone to be able to participate. So that I, I believe this has a much stronger global reach and is smart on the part of the game makers and clan people to have a Telegram chat room to be able to connect and get with people. So there's that. Um, we'll talk about the Eve clan and then kind of wrap up my discussion about just clan grouping in general 
And what I think maybe perhaps clans could do for the Bitcoin prize allocation. <coughs> and here is one of the earlier clans um, that show up, public clans that show up uh, on the Satoshi Treasure Hunt, which is the Eve clan. These are the rules. Uh, it's important that all members, we must respect the rules of the Satoshi's hunt. They also must respect fellow Discord members. If they don't, they'll be kicked out and banned. So rules. Don't be a jerk. I can write out a long list of no's, no racing, no section, etc. But we should all know what it means to not be a jerk. Don't do it. Don't spam. Yuck. Stay on topic. There are hundreds of people here and we care about this hunt. Each channel has a specific topic. topic. Stick to them or use random. Don't share sensitive information in public channels here. You all see keys, keys, fast versus key text itself. Message me on mod and we'll give you the instructions on how to share secretly. Uh, don't share personal information about people involved or not involved with the hunt. Don't harass people online or in real life for information. Put your location, nothing specific, in the channel. The mods will tag you in a certain region. Read through the links in the resource channel. The answers many questions. Check out things to do for you to contribute. And then the Eve clan has pretty much the most detailed uh, breakdown, if you will, for what they're seeking. So, <clears throat> Eve clan, the roadmap. One, make this clan the largest clan in order to get the best geographical coverage and most skills. Two, create a tool to track contributions from clan members in order to remove unproductive members and limit the final pay payout to true contributors. So right off the bat, you got to have to be pretty much a a significant level participant to be part of the clan. You can't just simply be a lurker, a lurker, if you will. Create a process of sharing information will prevent secrets from leaking. Initially, use a trusted leader, then over time move to systems without a single point of failure. So at first there'll be like a key holder and then eventually a series of key holders. Adapt the new developments in the hunt. Enjoy the hunt. So introduction. I have two objectives for the E clan. The first is for all participants to enjoy the hunt for Satoshi's treasure. The second is to find Satoshi's tre treasure and fairly split it among the Eve, EV clan members who meaningfully contribute to the effort. This robot explains how we can do this. I welcome feedback on this plan in the Discord in the channel. First off, create the largest clan. Um, at first glance, it seems like a bad goal to create the largest clan. The more people there are, the more likely secrets cannot be contained, and the final distribution to each member will be smaller than it would be in a smaller clan. However, the downsides can be mitigated and the upsides are significant. Upside, geographical diversity and more skills. Eric Melser, one of the leaders of the game, has stated that 20 to 30% of the keys require a physical presence to find, and has also stated that they purposely are aiming to make clues as international as possible they can. Clans with good geographical coverage will have a significant advantage in finding 200 to 300 more keys than clans which can only focus on online clues. Also, the most people, the, also the more people who can join, the more brains we have. Obviously, a knowledge of cryptography and puzzle solving is valuable, but those aren't the only useful skills to have. This is likely a several-month-long hunt, or perhaps longer, though likely not years. Eric hinted that the hunt could be an annual thing. And to become the winning clan, we need people who are good at managing the community, managing information, building tools, resulting recruiting for geographical diversity or specific need skills, negotiation to obtain other keys, and many other skills which aren't related to the actual game itself. A combination of geographical diversities and diverse skills will be essential for the winning clan, and the larger the clan, the more likely we are to obtain the diversity. Mitigating the downsides of a large clan. There are two primary pro problems with having a large clan. And this is what I was talking about earlier about group, you know, group dynamics, about the Dumber number, about you know, 150 people, uh, you know, social connections. Uh, secrets are likely to leak. Final distribution is split too many ways. These both can be mitigated by implementing the other steps in the roadmap. Creating a system for tracking clan contributions. This is something that this Toshi uh, cipher has already spelled out. Uh, it could be something other clans have spelled out, but you have to be an active participant member to know about that. Join the Discord and watching other people discover secrets shouldn't qualify you for membership in a clan or distribution if the clan finds a treasure. It would be essential that clan members are rewarded based on merit. A system will need to be created that enables an individual or group to determine how much individual or group within a clan have contributed to the overall success of the clan. That means the EV Discord membership and EV clan membership are, are not the same thing. 
If you're in the system as having contributed to the success of the clan, then you're a member in the payout. If you're not, then you're just in the Discord and will be moved at some point as described below. And so they're going to be kicking people out eventually. Objectives versus objective measures. Some aspects of this will be based on objective me measures. If someone finds a key and gives it to the clan, see step three. They may have clearly meaningfully contributed. If someone finds a clue in a physical location, shares a clue, and then someone else cracks it online and finds the key, then both of these people will, will get some credit. Some aspects, aspects of this will be based on subjective measures. This is clearly much more difficult to do and will require some serious thoughts about how to make it, it as fair as possible. The person who finds 10 keys will contribute massively to the clan, but what about the person who recruited him or her? Initially, the focus on the tool will be capture the objective measures. Once that has been squared away, we can then expand to capture subjective measures. That will likely be done with a group of clan members who have shown merit and dedication to the hunt. This means that where, where our clan to find treasure, the final distribution would be based on being in the clan itself, but based on how much you have been determined to have contributed to the clan's overall success. Someone who, for example, helps moderate the discord and finds no keys will be rewarded, but not as much as someone who finds five keys. Limiting payout and moving unprotected members. The merit-based system means that overall size of the clan won't be diminished, the final payout except when clan members meaningfully contribute and bring us closer to finding the treasure. It also means that we can remove unprotected members from the Discord occasionally. Uh, user JNJ1999 proposed the following system. Maybe there may be a way we can stagger the group size, i.e. based on milestones or clues earned, i.e. 1 through 100 group open. Once we hit 150, group size shrinks based on certain criteria. Lowest contributors move somehow, and so on and so on. So once we get closer to the end, the group is smaller and, and most committed. I think this prudent and plan to begin removing non contributing members once a certain milestone to reach. 3. Creating a process for sharing and protecting information. The larger the clan, the less able to keep secrets. Many of the hundreds of people in the EV Discord are lurking, trying to get free information for themselves and other clans f form spies will become commonplace. This means the important information cannot be openly shared across the entire group. A good process is needed to ensure that the clan members have the ability to coordinate, figure out clues, both online and offline, without revealing this information to everyone. This is especially true for the most private information, the URL to the keys, the passphrases, and the keys themselves. Over time, this issue becomes slightly easier to deal with because non-productive members will be booted, but it's still a problem even when the group size shrinks. There are various proposals how to deal with this. Trusted leaders. The simplest approach is to have a trusted leader who receives the information from clan members and doesn't share it with anyone. They will be responsible for updating the clan contribution tracker for objective contribu contributors like Keys. This has the advantage of simplicity and also centralizes the risk to a single party instead of spreading the risk to multiple parties. It has several drawbacks all related to the fact that the trusted leader is a single point of failure. If the leader isn't trustworthy, they can take the funds themselves. If they don't manage the secrets properly, they can be lost or stolen. If they have an emergency or are even just sleeping when the, the last key is found, no one else in the clan can do anything about it until they're available again. Trusted Council. A council can be established to do the same thing as a single leader but without the single point of failure. The downside is an increase in the area of exposure to sensitive information. This can be somewhat mitigated by not having all the information accessible to all council members, but split up between them. This re reinterests the single points of failure again, but this can be mitigated by suggestions from user Phil Fluster. To prevent keys from getting lost, for example, when a finder disappears slash dies, the finder within the key can also could maybe also split it up using Shamir's magic and send individual fragments to the members of this group so that the lost keys can still be recovered if the majority of the group agrees to. The other downside of this approach is that more work than a single trusted leader. A trustless system. The ideal approach would be the creation of a trusted system, like based on a smart contract. Users can submit secrets, and if they are valid, unlikely have their Bitcoin address entered into a toll. They can immediately claim the treasure private key and distribute funds to those who have contributed. The system has the highest cost of creation, and it's also not very clear that it's feasible. The goal is to progress along these different strategies, start with a trusted leader, then move towards a council, and then move to a trusted system. I will act as a trusted leader to start when several trustworthy people from the clan prove themselves over time and we have built have a system built to share secrets, I'll move to council. Is it possible to to it's possible to move to a smart contract trusted system and has it been built and we're confident it works, then we can end up there finally. It assumes a few things. It assumes there will be enough trustworthy people to create a council. It assumes that a trustless system is feasible to build in time available and that people are willing to 
spend their time building it. If their assumptions prove inaccurate, we will continue using whatever method we, we got stuck at. Loose lips, loose sets. I will enable Discord moderators remove or reject sensitive information from public channels into smaller, more trusted groups. Discussing theories or hunches in public channels or coordinate efforts is good, but as information gets more sensitive, it should be restricted to smaller, more trusted groups within the clan. With the most sensitive information only shared with the leader or council, key URLs, key passphrases, keys. Step four, adapting to changing hunting dynamics. This is probably the most detailed map of all the public clans I've seen. And so it's something that any future clan or current clan could easily adapt, adopt or change, if you will. Soon a tool will be released by the STC, ST team, which will allow people to prove they hold keys without sharing the keys themselves. They had this up on their website and then it got taken down. This tool will lead to the emergence of a marketplace for keys. Individual mercenaries will try to sell their keys off to the highest bidder, and serious clans will have individuals or even teams dedicated to finding and negotiating deals for keys without even playing the game itself. Once the key verification tool becomes available, we'll start figuring out how to best use this emerging market to our advantage. So that's kind of emerging already with a couple of keys, like the geolocation key, one of them, uh, the bone key, a couple of keys you have people saying, hey, pay me up or I won't give you the key. And I think as time progresses, as we get narrower, you know, closer to that 400, um, not all keys are going to be publicly disclosed, not all keys are going to be available to all clans and or individuals who acquire them. So there will be a marketplace. That's just one example of changing dynamic. Verifiable keys can cause fundamental changes to how the game is played. The winning clan will need to adapt to those changing mo changes moving forward. The winning strategy might be negotiated, or it might be focused on boots on the ground, or it might be focused on having the world's best cartographers or some combination of strategy. Adaptability is important. And five, enjoy the hunt. I already got a job and don't need a second one. I'm doing this because it's fun and because I like to stack Satoshis. If this ever becomes to feel like another job, then we're doing it wrong. I hope the Discord is a place where people can enjoy sharing theories and hashing out clues, no matter how crazy they are. I hope we will get to feel the excitement of being one of the strongest clans out there, finding keys no one else has, and if we follow the plan, I think it's generally possible. That's my plan. You can, for the moment, join the Discord at this link. So that is EV uh, clan's plan. And from there, I think it's pretty clear about distribution of the prize, what they're looking for, how they want to make the group dynamic. There's enough flexibility within the plan to allow for adjustments or contributions from clan members and people to make some input to the plan. So everyone kind of is on the same page. And that's why I saved this particular clan for last because they had the most detailed map out, as Libby says, a roadmap of how their clan wants to govern itself. Okay, so I kind of want to share, well, all the clans have kind of danced around the prize allocation um, and have different philosophies about that. I kind of wanted to share my thoughts on how one could um, do that. I have here uh, the Bitcoin Satoshi to USD value. Um, one Satoshi is... Uh, not even a penny. One U.S. dollar is nine thousand three hundred fifty-seven satoshis, which is zero point zero 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 nine three five seven in uh, BTC format. Um, I do think in one Bitcoin is right now is ten thousand six hundred seventy-nine dollars and thirty-five cents. I do think when talking about prize allocation that people should probably emphasize the, the Bitcoin amount and not necessarily the USD amount, like the Satoshi amount versus the dollar amount, if you will, simply because we are in the cryptocurrency community. People do hold, people do uh, use, you know, crypto for funds and that, that nature. And by thinking in that dynamic than the USD amount, I think people would have less hurt feelings because it's something like, there's only 21 million Bitcoins. So if you have even a fractional portion of a Bitcoin, 
you're really ahead, way ahead of the game versus, you know, the rest of the world. And I think that would help people understand, like, their what they're getting, particularly if you can kind of educate people about holding that value could that small amount of you will that allocation could easily increase in value over time. And, you know, something that might not be like a, a fiat at the moment value could, like I said, increase over time. And I think that will allow people to realize that when they're getting a, they're not getting a full Bitcoin, they're getting a fraction of a Bitcoin as a prize amount that they will frame themselves a little bit differently on the mindset that the value of what they're what they're getting. Now, also at the same time, I understand globally speaking, um, with various income levels and how like the dollar even a satoshi can go to, I can understand the eagerness and um, where people don't really care and they're going to cash out, why they might have a need for that. And I, I totally get that. I understand that economic and that that base need. Um, but I do think of just preparing people that understanding very early on in the group dynamic, it, it will help when it comes down to the price allocation for people to, um, to, to, to take it, if you will, to take what they're getting, um, as a, a prize amount. Now, when I did this, I, I acknowledge that there's going to be workers and clans, that there might not be people that are contributing to the clan at all. And... I factor that in and I call that the asshole tax really where it's easy for just uh, or you can say the uh, mercenary tax or not mercenary but the uh, not the big but you're paying off the mob just just to just to get the the mob to go away and it's not going to be a, a significant amount and if you declare it right off the bat I think when people just work in and realizing, oh, I get a couple hundred bucks just to sit here, it it might in fact just it mitigate any type of issues. So here here is what I I put together. <clears throat> I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven categories. I have the worker category, the social category, the best of the best, um, the best solve, um, outstanding member. Um, the one and POW. So here's what each category is. Just being part of the group or part of the clan, if you will. You get, say for example, you cap your amount uh, to 200 people and it can be either one to two Bitcoins. So I have here where it's actually the amount is two Bitcoins. Um, the top amount, if you will, dispense, means that 0.0009 per person is distributed amongst 200 people for a USD value of $101 as of today's market prices. That means if that's all you do uh, and the prices stay up to around 10000 to when um, the game is over like a year from now, then it's like, like I said, it's like 100 bucks paying the mob off, if it will. And with the worker category and with all these categories, one individual can easily be in, in all these categories. There's not anything that would exclude anybody from that. And I think that would help really for our group dynamics and mitigating any infighting and anything like that if there's just a bare minimum entry of just a little amount. It could be one Bitcoin distributed across the whole clan group or one to two as I put that flexible number. Um, the one and two I put was for moderators, uh, the social kind of dynamic, moderators, admins, social people perform the nitty gritty of the communication and of keeping the clan together. So Discord channels, tel Telegram channels, uh, Weeble, uh, Twitter, uh, blog posts, um, any information gathering where uh, people gather like whatever clue hints or something like that um, and a PDF file or uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet or any kind of time chart or Google Doc, uh, it will allow people, you know, doing that nitty gritty that's very difficult. Like you have one or two or maybe three people that are gathering all the, the clue data together and allowing for people to view, share, and contribute. It will allow for that kind of, that, that, that's, like I said, the nitty gritty, the, the, the unseemliness, if you will, sometimes of keeping group dynamics. 
uh, moderation to keep these flowing to make sure people are, are you know where they're going which clues they're working on administration that that kind of nitty-gritty detail of that work you know everyone's volunteering that takes time you have people doing it at different types of hours you know if you're keeping this global and you want to keep it 24 7 you have people probably doing shifts and stuff like that um allowing for things like that i even want to say just being in the, the chat and maybe doing like some of the meme or jokes or questioning like the the game moderators or even the chat you know the chat itself and asking pointed tw questions to kind of get the clan kind of talking or thinking a certain way or clarifications sometimes you know performing another task if you have it like if you have a writer's block or you have uh, you've been working on a problem and you're just you you're just seeing numbers and it's just a haze. Sometimes taking a step back and doing a different task or several tasks or taking a break allows for the mind to just kind of go away and still work on it in the background, but it's not such the primary focus that is draining. And sometimes having those silly conversations or going into the random channel or talking about something different can kind of get the, the juices going. Or even asking simple, basic questions. A lot of these clues we kind of get tripped up on because we're overthinking it a little bit. And sometimes if someone asking like the most simplest basic question makes you rethink the nature of a particular clue or realize a different viewpoint or perspective. And if you have someone consistently doing that within the group, it, it can be very helpful of keeping the group dynamic and the dialogue going. And so that's why I have the social thing here where you have one to two Bitcoin and I have them like amount of people, I uh, like cap, and these are just random numbers really, at uh, 25 where that's split among the group and what they're getting. And of course, this, you know, because there's less people, if you have the high end here, which I do on the amount dispense, you know, they have a higher amount. So they can be. You know, moderator, admin, they're not, you know, crypto people that are maybe they're not getting the key solves. They're kind of lurking, not necessarily lurking, but just because they're part of the group, you know, you're stacking some Satoshis here. You're slowly building up to the potential of earning one, a full Bitcoin on your own, just participating on this game. And then I have the best of the best category. Individual hunter slash pair or even slash group, if you will who consistently brings it for the clan. So if you're constantly solving for keys or you're constantly, you know, on it when it comes to uh, geolocations or recruiting people or even negotiating for keys or um, finding that certain thing that helps the group go along, you know, I, I guess there could be like a nomination pro process where you can have um, up, you know, the top 10 people within the group and an allocation of um, one Bitcoin apiece for them. I know it's a high amount, but I'm just saying like their, their contribution, their, that dynamic is so significant, that best of the best elite, like the Heisman tof Trophy of the, the solving of your clan er, is going to, to these people. And it can be like a community nomination or something like that to where these people are highly valued for their skill set or their the, what they bring to the clan. And of course, with one Bitcoin per person, right now it's around 10K plus, is something that they can get in USD value. And again, they just being part of the group, you know, maybe they're also an admin and they're, you know, they're solving for stuff or they're doing a lot for the clan. You know, here you are, you know, in three categories, stacking up those Satoshi, stacking up that, that amount, if you will. And then I have the solve, where it can be anywhere from 1 to 20 people because there's 400 keys potentially that we have to acquire, but it could be like, as I talked to about in the past, 0 through 575 or 0 through 600. And out of that 400, you know, we, we got those solves out of the 1,000 keys. And it's, you know, the hunters or hunter who solved the most difficult key in the game. For example, the earth key. It's been two months. No one has been able to solve it yet. Um, you know, for example, when that happens, that could be like whoever solves that more difficult, the most difficult key. Uh, they should be rewarded, that particular person or person. So maybe you can have the nomination of the most difficult outlandish key out there. That's the grand prize of one Bitcoin. And 
that can go to either single uh, hunter or hunters that are responsible for that particular solve and they're splitting that one Bitcoin and then you can have sub tier categories of maybe the best geolocation that was so crazy to get to that person being able to acquire it um, the logic one uh, task one or something like that the different kind of solve categories and from there you can like split one Bitcoin out of all the different categories however you want to subdivide it I had up to like 20 people in that kind of subdivision category kind of makes it fun for the clan the group like goals or things like that where you were the person that went I don't know the North Pole Somehow they got a geolocation in the North Pole and you had to connect or you were like in Alaska or some part of Canada and you were able, or Russia or wherever, Norway, and you were able to get to the North Pole and say hey to the, you know, Santa Claus's reindeer. And because it was such an outlandish geolocation, you got a portion of that, you know, that salt prize, if you will. And then um, outstanding clan member that just brings it to the group. There's the way above the best of the best, where more of the best of the best is kind of, I would say, task oriented of like the different types of solves, if you will, which could be different from solving the hard key because maybe they didn't never solve the earth key, but or even hard key, those type of hard keys. But they're they're constantly solving the logic keys. They're constantly solving task keys, or they're constantly solving something or participate being part of the group that solves whatever key is available like the mnemonic key or something like that they're always kind of there um, that's like the best of the best but this is like the outstanding the cream of the cream the cream of the crop and I will put like you know again you could buy subcategory this if you want to that's why these um, these last ones have the little brackets where it's not necessary to be the case you could just have one winner or one Bitcoin allocated for however many people you want to distribute to. So the outstanding clan member that just brings it to the group that has nothing to do with the, you know, the merit base of solving for keys, but it could be something a little extra, or maybe they're just that key solver, if you will. And so you can have somebody, like I said, where kind of like the best of the best or the best solve or the outstanding member clans where you can really be somebody that's, constantly solving these keys or, or contributions to the clan in that kind of merit-based way um, allows for someone to be, you know, recognized for that in that in that capacity where maybe they're not, you know, they don't have 20 solves or 15 solves or 30 keys under their belt, but they have, you know, with some of these solves, they're the best of the best, they have enough of these kind of plays within the, the, the community that they can be recognized. But, you know, you have that one outstanding member that's just there all the time with the win. And, um, you know, the MVP, if you will, uh, that, that, that's its type of a category. And then the one, I kind of put like a goof, like one off, you know, major or minor contribution to the game th that can't be truly measured, really. Um, maybe they're the great negotiator. Maybe they are the... Um, geolocator maybe they're just the meme king and they're just constantly memeing within the, the group um in a fun you know fun way that just kind of keeps the group going and they're just like a kind of their person that's there for the clan that's just another one where it's not really truly like merit-based i just kind of put that put there that's kind of optional and stuff like that and depending on the flexibility of how you want to distribute these different kind of categories um, you have 100, 174 to 184 bitcoins to allocate to those hunters that actually do the work. They're doing the solves. And you can do the point system like the, the Toshi Cypher group is doing. Um, whatever conceivable point system or merit system that the E clan is doing. Or I, I imagine a bunch of clans are doing allocations for the people and dispensement of that that. Um, that price, and I put down here 65. So say the clan is 200 people, really. Uh, like with any group or any dynamic or any type of business, it's always the smallest subset of people that are doing the most contribution for anything. And so I put the number 65 down here. And when you do it like that, it can be anywhere between 2.6 to 2.8 Bitcoin per person. Not to mention these other type of categories where someone can conceivably walk away 
you know, with the, just the minimum of power, uh, proof of work, if they don't get any of these other categories besides the worker one, um, can walk anywhere away from, you know, three to, to five to maybe six Bitcoin, you know, walking away here with, with this prize money, if you will. And that's, that's quite a lot. Um, you know, that puts you in pretty big elite category when it comes to, to Bitcoin, if you will. And if you start emphasizing that within the clan, the group dynamic, really, the people are going to really think differently versus, you know, that economic USD value, which, I, again, I do understand. You, people got bills to pay, they're in debt, you know, different economic situations for people. If they're cashing out, they're cashing out. I completely understand that. But if this game is supposed to be educational and you're not only education educating yourself as, uh, as uh, the different puzzle solves, uh, being part of this game, um, educating people outside of this game, uh, just watching us play, if you will. Um, that's one of the points of the game by the game makers. Then if you don't emphasize the, you know, the nature or the emphasis on either holding or the value of Satoshis or stacking Satoshis or the value of uh, Bitcoin and the splitting of it, if you will, or the, the soundness of money that Bitcoin is, then I think you're kind of losing something here in the sauce, if you will, uh, as a participant of this particular uh, game. So there's that, that Bitcoin price if it's between 190 to 200, which many people have estimated. I, I don't know, I'm a hopeful, hopeful optimist, optimist person. Um, I'm kind of going, I'm a hopeful person. I'm kind of going on the high end because we really don't know fundamentally, you know, what that Bitcoin address is or when the game makers created it. Because you have to think, they've, been planning this game for almost two years. It's clear by even with some of the faults with some of the different clues that the this is a well planned out um, game. That uh, they had to test out the Shamir, you know, splitting for the Bitcoin address at some point with some Bitcoin, and then once they've tested it out and knew they could do it safely and securely, then pulling whatever bitcoins they pulled together or even if they pulled bitcoins we're really not sure how they did this uh we don't know when they created the bitcoin address and split it so at the time of the creation is when the economic value of when uh, that million dollar price can be and the last couple of years the lowest price has been three thousand when it comes to bitcoin so 300 is probably like the highest it could potentially be for that Bitcoin address, and because the value of Bitcoin has gone up um, since that splitting of the uh, Bitcoin uh, private key, um, of course the value of the of the overall price um, has gone up. So again, same category, um, just a different economic values, different numbers down here. Maybe just a little bit more when it comes to the parentheses category. And again, I have like the one through five, one through, you know, one through five, one through 10. Like I still think, you know, the best of the best should get a Bitcoin really, um, these different type of categories. But these, these are just my thoughts. Um, clients are gonna do whatever they want, want to do. People are gonna agree upon it because they're, they're looking to stack some Satoshis, they're looking to participate in this game. They're just looking for a reward in some sense or just having a good time. So the prize might not even really matter to them. Um, I'm personally open to suggestions or maybe specifying the categories more clearly or adding some categories. Um, there'll be a link in the show notes to everything I talked about and all the different informations, particularly uh, the different clans and um, their sites are just going on Telegram there and, and joining. Uh, that's also in the show notes. But again, this is just, you know, my thoughts about clan dynamics, um, what public clans are out there. Basically, how you can join is just going through the Satoshi's Treasure Telegram um, channel and just putting yourself out there and either joining an existing group or developing a group yourself. Um, I'm personally going to start exploring other social media apps to see if there's any Satoshi clans there as well, if there's any public groups that we just are not fully aware of, or maybe private groups, really. i um, going to look at WhatsApp and stuff like that, but... If you're a public clan and you want to get a shout out or you want some recognition, um, 
You can always hit me up in the comment section, or hit me up on Telegram. I have the links to find me uh, in the show notes. I'm more than willing to put you in my show notes and making people aware of your existence. So that way you can attain, you know, the different hunters you need for your particular clan. So my name is Herodes Sharp. This has been Satoshi's Treasure Hunters. And on with the hunt.